Single point cut this, I said. It'll be fun, I said. I should have just bought the forking tap. Hello Internet, my name is Quentin and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to build a boiler feed water pump. This is a crucial component to a steam plant or a locomotive or any system that uses a steam boiler for continuous operation. Water in a boiler is consumable and you need a way to force water back into it while it's operating. It's kind of like an inflate refueling for boilers, if you will. Now this project is going to include a really awesome collaboration with my friend and fellow YouTuber Ron Covell. He's an awesome fabricator and sheet metal worker. I learn so much from every one of his videos. So his collaboration is going to be primarily featured in part two of this two-part series. So stay tuned for that. Now let's get going on this pump. Regular viewers will know I recently built this large steam engine and I'm kind of on a mini side quest now to see if I can get it to run on live steam. I don't plan to build a giant boiler for it just yet, but I do have this small boiler that I built for a different engine that I think is probably capable of taking over this big engine. However, while this little boiler is actually quite a steam demon, it runs out of water very quickly because it doesn't have a lot of water storage inside. It's very full of fire tubes in there, which is a good thing for boiler performance. But the solution to the water problem is of course a boiler feed pump. You need a way to replenish that water while the boiler is running. And a feed pump is what does that. So I have here PM Research's boiler feed pump kit, and I'm going to build it. I've had this thing on my shelf for honestly years, and it's finally time to bust it out. If you're looking for a kind of a beginning model engineering project, like you're not really sure if this hobby is for you, but you want to give it a shot, I think this kit is a great thing to build. It's a single casting, it's bronze, really easy to machine, easy to set up, and then a handful of other parts to be made from bar stock, and a single page of drawings. It's really quite an enjoyable little thing to build. As always, I start by fettling the casting. I'm just removing all of the sprue lines and flashing from where the split line was on the cope and the drag when this was sand cast. In principle, you don't have to do this to any surfaces that will be machined, but I tend to do it anyway because it makes setup of those surfaces easier. On any casting, the first step is generally to figure out a reference surface that you can create to use for all the other features. In this case, I think the bottoms of the feet are the obvious choice. So I'm looking for a way to fixture it here so that I can machine those. And the straightest thing on the casting looks to be the webbing in between the body there and the feet. So I think if I set this up in the vise with some packing, I think I can clamp it there and get a reasonably flat and square set of feet from that. A raw casting never has any real references on it, so you just kind of have to pick something and start with that. And then once you've got a single machined surface, try to make everything else relative to that. Then I want to get it as level as possible. So I've got my DTI in here and I'm indicating on the underside of that webbing there. It looks pretty straight and there's no draft angle in this direction. So it's a reasonably good indicating surface. Of course, the needle is going to bounce around a lot because it is a sand casting. So you just kind of have to average the noise and aim for the smallest amount of deflection that you can get. And bronze castings are usually a little easier in this regard. They're usually a little smoother than iron castings are. And these PM Research castings are really nice. So this indicating actually goes quite well. I've got it within one or two thousandths there. And then I machine those feet until they are fully cleaned up. I don't know if you can tell on the video here, but the draft angle is crossways on those feet. So you can see that the edges of the feet are cleaning up last. Now while I'm in this setup, I can drill the mounting holes in the feet as well. So I'm using a gauge pin there that's the same diameter roughly as the end of the casting there so that I can get it lined up and centered on the foot there. So I center it up by feel and then I set the absolute zero on my DRO right there. And then I go and do the same thing on the opposite corner and I set the incremental zero on my DRO there. So then I have two zero zero points on opposite corners of the part and that gives me the coordinates for all four. Now the drawing doesn't actually have any bolt pattern for these feet. It's really just a case of centering them cosmetically on each foot, but it's nice to keep them in a square if you can. So I check each foot and make sure that if I do use the same X, Y at each end, that it's all gonna line up well and the casting is good, so it does. If the casting had a little twist or something in it, then they might not. 
and I would probably have erred on the side of making them look good rather than being an exact rectangular pattern. And that trick of using a gauge pin the same size as the casting to line it up is a trick that I got from my viewers, because that's quite a difficult thing to do any other way. So thanks, viewers. That's everything that I can get from that setup, so I'll pull it out and give everything a little deburr. And if I did my job right, that should now sit nice and flat on a machined surface there, which it does. There's no rock or anything in that, so that went really well. We're off to a good start here. So now I'll put that reference down on my table, and I'm going to create all the features needed on this top boss here. I found a piece of scrap in the bin that has, again, the same diameter as the casting there, and happens to have a narrower section on it that'll fit in my drill chuck, so that's handy. Once again, I line that up by feel and then zero my DRO right there. I've got a whole bunch of hole making types of features to create from this orientation here. So I'll be using this setup for quite a while. I'm going to start by machining that surface flat. Not only will this be flat, but this will be parallel to the bottoms of the feet there because I have it clamped to the mill table. That's actually going to be really useful later because it's going to give me a clamping surface across the casting. After center drilling that, I'm going to drill a pilot all the way down to the depth specified in the drawing. What we're doing here is creating the valve seats. This type of basic piston pump works by having two check valves, one above the other. When the piston is pulled back, it draws water in through one check valve into the piston area. And then when the piston moves forward again, that bottom check valve closes, the upper check valve opens, and the water is pushed out into the outlet. So this is a really crucial set of operations that I'm doing here to create the valve seats and those water passages. The most crucial feature here are the valve seats, of course. This design calls for square valve seats, so we need a way to create a flat-bottomed edge on the next hole that we create. You could do that with an end mill if the hole diameter happened to match a standard end mill size. In this case, it does not. So the drawing actually recommends creating a square ground drill for this purpose. Now I have a secret weapon up my sleeve. I actually have these DeWalt drills here that have a square grind on them. These were sent to me by a viewer. I didn't know these drills existed. And they're really, really useful for features just like this. There's certain features like a square shoulder of an arbitrary diameter around a smaller hole that is really difficult to create in small spaces like this. DeWalt calls these their pilot point drill series, and I'll link to a set of these below. Hashtag not sponsored, but again, for model engineering, they really actually solve a surprising number of problems. After that small valve seat at the bottom, I then come in with a larger pilot point DeWalt drill, hashtag not sponsored, and create the upper valve seat, which is larger. Of course, the lower valve seat has to be smaller than the upper one, not for any functional reason, but just because otherwise there'd be no way to manufacture those features. A word of caution on these pilot point bits. The way I'm using them here is technically not correct. The pilot point is floating in space inside an existing hole, so I'm really just relying on the grind on the square shoulders of the drill to be perfectly balanced and keep the drill running straight. That, of course, is no guarantee, so what's actually happening probably is that the holes are being created a little bit oversized. But in this case, that's fine. The diameter of these holes isn't crucial. I just need those square shoulders. But it is a good thing to keep in mind. These drills, while neat, are designed to be run into solid stock so that that pilot point keeps them on track. And of course, all of this drilling is happening to very precise depths as specified in the drawing to make sure all of these little shoulders and such end up the right distances away from the inlets and so on so that all the check valves end up functioning correctly. Here you can see the final result of all of that effort. There's the through hole at the very bottom there that goes down to the inlet. And then above that is the tiny lower check valve seat. And then above that is the larger check valve seat. And then above that is the outlet. Now we've ended up with a big hole in the top of the pump that serves no purpose other than access for manufacture. So now we create a thread in the top of this so that we can create a plug that will then close this up for good. Of course, you also want a plug here so that you can access the check valves if you need to replace the balls or, you know, repair the seats or something along those lines. Just need to clean some chips out of there, but otherwise that's looking good. On now to the most interesting feature, which is the thread for the piston. This is interesting because it's a 9 16 18 thread, which is a very common thread, but happens to be larger than my largest taps and dies. This being a model engineering shop, I'm pretty much limited to below half an inch on everything. 
So I looked at ordering that tap and die, but it was going to take a while to get it here. I couldn't find it locally. So I thought, well, I'm a glutton for punishment. Let's see if we can single point cut this thread. The main challenge is going to be reach. You can see with my internal threading tool here, we'll need to be extended long enough to reach over the foot of the casting there. And that's a lot of stick out, way too much for a tool that small. Looking through my tooling drawers, I found this boring bar holder. This was actually in a care package that a viewer sent me many years ago. And so then I went digging through my stock bin and I found this chunk of boring bar. This is actually a micro 100 boring bar that I cut short for the big steam engine project. I had an especially crazy operation to do with the boring head that you may recall if you watched that series. And this chunk has been in my scrap bin. It's going to be just perfect for this job. So I set it up in the lathe and faced off the end as is tradition. And then I drilled and reamed a hole down the center that is the same size as that carbide blank there that my internal threading tool was ground from. A little test fit here to make sure that's going to work. And actually that fit came out so good that I've got kind of an air spring effect in there, which is always extremely satisfying when that happens. That's down to that being a good quality reamer and this carbide blank having a very good surface finish on it, I'm sure. Then a quick trip to the cross drilling fixture to drill and tap some set screws to hold the tool in there. And that's really all we need here. Putting it all together now, you can see how this is going to work. I'm going to shorten those set screws, but for now you can just see how this works. That bar is going to reach over the foot of the casting so that the actual threading tool does not require much stick out to get the full depth of thread that I'm going to need in there. Now the other end of that carbide blank is currently unused, so I'm going to create a grooving tool on the other end of it. I need a half round internal grooving tool to create the base of the thread in there. That's not a tool that I happen to have, so over to the D-bit grinder to grind that up. I start by grinding in the clearance at the base of the grooving profile. Then I swing the end of the tool around to create the outer part of the nose radius there. Now this particular D-bit grinder does not let me do a full 180 degree arc on the end of a tool like this. I can do a little more than 90 if I loosen one of those locks, but I can't get 180. So I do the other half of the curve just by hand. And this doesn't have to be super perfect. It's just to create a groove for the threading tool to start in. And then I go back in with my angles set on the head to create the clearances on the end of the tool and a few other miscellaneous clearances just in case, like in this straight section here behind the cutting portion of the tool and so on. And there's the final round nose grooving tool. It's not going to win any beauty contests and it's certainly not a perfect radius on the end of the nose there, but it's certainly going to do the job. And then on the other end is my left hand internal threading tool, which I've ground up previously and used before. Again, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but I know it makes good threads. Of course, single point cutting this means I'm going to have to set it up on the lathe with that feature facing the tailstock, which is a little tricky. I considered some faceplate options here with angle plates or one, two, three blocks. And that would probably work, but it would be pretty complicated and require some counterweighting. So then I thought, well, it might fit in the fore jaw. And sure enough, it does. In fact, not only does it fit, but the jaws actually line up really nicely on the casting features there for a really secure grip. So the fore jaw is going to be the way to go. Before I set it up on the lathe, though, I want to create the basic reference features here on the mill because it's going to be a lot easier to do it here. Once I've got some basic references, it's going to really simplify setting this thing up on the lathe. So I'm clamping it in the vise again using those parallel faces that we created on the bottoms of the feet and the top of the valve body there. And then I want to get it straight vertically. Now again, I don't have any references in this axis on this casting, but the sides of the webbing of the feet there is actually really straight. So I just used that and I was able to get it within a thou, thou and a half, something like that. It's never ideal when you have to use a casting surface as a reference, but you know, when you're in the early stages of machining a casting like this, there's just no other choice. And then I will machine this. And in principle, this surface should now be very square to the bottoms of the feet and the top of the valve body there. And 
Next up, using another piece of scrap that I found, again, that's the same diameter as that cast boss. I'm going to line up the spindle on the center there, and I'm going to create a center reference for the features that I'm going to be creating here, namely the hole and the threads. Once again, this is much, much easier to do on the mill, so I'm going to do it here while I have it set up. And I'm going to put a center in that, and now I've got sufficient reference to set it up on the lathe and find that center again. Ironically, I'm going to all this trouble to make sure that I don't dig up that foot on the casting with the lathe, and, well, here on the mill, where it's easy to avoid doing that, is where I did it. So over to the lathe it is. I'm going to set it up in the fore jaw, just like I did on the bench. It's always good to do a test of a setup like this on the bench, because it's a lot easier to see if it's going to work when you're not fighting gravity with the chuck sitting vertical in the lathe. Two of the jaws are on machined parallel surfaces there, on the feet and the valve body, so that's good. The two side jaws, though, are just on the casting, so they probably will need some tweaking to get straight. But I'm going to start by dialing in the center there. So I'm going to bring in my dead center and suspend it between my live center and the center in the casting. And then I just dial in this dead center. And that's going to get that center that I created on the mill on the center line of the lathe. This is a really easy technique for getting any kind of punch mark or center drill on center in the lathe. And the cork down there is just to catch anything that might fall. It is possible for the dead center to fall while you're doing that if things get a little too loose. It might still need straightening though in the jaws, so I did some checks here with a dial indicator along the length of the casting here in some areas that are hopefully straight. Again, indicating on a casting is always a little bit of a gamble, but these castings do look pretty good. So I checked a few different places longitudinally here, and actually everything was within a thousandth. So, you know, these are good castings, and I think the grip that I have on the parallel surfaces there did a nice job of kind of squaring it up in the jaws for me, and uh, everything looks really good here. So I don't see any need to make adjustments. If I had needed to tap that in, then I would have had to redo the dialing in, of course, after that, and go back and forth until both of those sets of indications are all on zeros. A final icrometer check says that it's running true, so we're going to go with this. Now, it may look like it's wobbling a bit on camera. That's because the lathe is actually shaking a little bit. There is, of course, some off-center mass there, and this is not a very big lathe, so I have to keep the RPM down to keep that vibration to a minimum which makes drilling this first hole kind of fun because it's running way too slowly for a drill this small. That just means I have to drill slowly and progress is slow. And unfortunately, this is a very deep hole and I actually ran out of drill here. This is a regular jobber length drill and it's not quite enough to clear the foot of the casting there. So luckily, I have an aircraft drill in this exact size. I have a few aircraft drills that came in another care package sent by a viewer at some point. And, uh, well, today is its day to shine. That aircraft drill had a good grind on it, and it did a beautiful job. Now I need a series of larger holes above that one that need to be very accurate depth. So for that, I've set up a dial indicator on my quill here. I preload that all the way up, and that'll allow me to get these next few drills to just the right place. These are various diameters that are part of how the piston works. So I'm just following the drawing here to get these different diameters to the right depths. It's similar to how we did the valve bodies, but no square shoulders or anything tricky required here. Just a series of different diameter holes that all involve the functioning of the piston. Finally, I need the tapping drill size for a 9 16 18 thread. However, I don't actually have that drill, same as I don't have the tap. So I've drilled it out half inch, which is the largest drill I have without going over that size. And then I'm going to come in with the boring bar and bore it out to the final tapping drill size for 9 16 18. Of course, I'm going to be single point cutting this, but the starting hole size is the same for a tap or for single pointing an internal thread. And amusingly, I also don't have a gauge pin large enough or any other way to measure that hole. So before starting this, I actually turned up a little go no go gauge on the lathe here so I would know when that tapping hole was the correct size. I just did very light cuts a little bit at a time on that boring bar until my go no go gauge slid in nicely. And that actually worked out really well. You gotta be patient because if you take too big a cut and go over, well, now you're done. Next up is the round groove at the base of the thread. So I've got my round grooving tool that we just ground up and I put that in my snazzy boring bar extension. I need the top rake on this tool to be zero, so I'm kind of cheating here and just using a digital level for this. 
Setting the top rake on a round shank small tool like this can be a little tricky. If it's shorter, you can use a square from the cross slide, something like that, but I didn't have any reference surfaces way out here in space, so the digital level got me close enough. And then I touch off on the outside and I use the DRO to measure my depth to get that tool in the correct place. And then a little hand spin here to make sure my clearances are gonna be okay. Not just at this point, but make sure the clearances are gonna be okay when the tool is at full depth, which you can usually just kind of eyeball. And then away we go. So I feed that grooving tool all the way in, again using my DRO to measure the depth of my cut here until it's where the math says it should be for an 18 TPI thread. You want to end up with this groove internal diameter being a little larger than the major diameter of the thread so that the threading tool will never touch that groove during the entire threading operation. And that looks really good in there. I did get a little bit of chatter at the end, which you probably heard, but yeah, it'll be inside this thing for life and nobody will ever know. So we'll just keep that between us. Next, I can flip that tool around and set up for the threading. Again, using the digital level to get the top rake at zero there. And of course, this is a left-hand internal threading tool. It's oriented to the opposite side from normal threading because I'm going to be threading this inside out. I'm going to be threading left to right, which is a really great way to do an internal thread up to a hard shoulder like that. It's zero drama to do it this way. So I've got the lathe running in reverse, I've got my threading gears set to 18 TPI, and away we go. Aside from that kind of tricky setup and the offhand tool that you might have to grind, there's really nothing different from doing this than any other normal threading operation. The hole is big enough that I can sneak my thread pitch gauge in there and just make sure that my gears are set correctly, and they are. So away we go, doing a series of passes. Of course, the next interesting question is, how do I know when I'm done? I don't actually have any way to measure a small internal thread like this. And unfortunately, I didn't have any 9 16 18 bolts on hand, nor did my local hardware store have any. So I can't even use a commercial bolt as a go-no-go -no -go gauge, if you will. So I had really no way to know when this thread was the correct dimension. What I decided to do was just go by the numbers. I have an indicator set on my tool post so I know when my thread depth is where Machinery's Handbook says it should be. And then if it's off a little bit, that's okay because I'm going to be cutting the external thread next and I can tailor that to fit this one, which is much easier to do with an external thread. Another approach here would be to do the external thread first because those are easily measured with thread wires even if you don't have any other method of doing so and then you cut the internal thread to match the external one. Now that would be a good approach if you were mainly concerned with interchangeability, if you needed to be able to thread standard bolts into this or made up with another part made elsewhere or by someone else. But interchangeability doesn't matter here. I'm actually more concerned with the thread being a good fit. So that's why I did the internal thread first because internal threads are trickier to cut and it's much easier to massage an external thread to fit an internal one than the other way around. Nothing else is ever going to be threaded into this hole except its own mating part, so using thread wires to get the exact dimensions of the thread is less important than just getting a good fit. So that was a series of tricky operations that all had to go perfectly, and as you can see that went really, really well. Now, lest you think that I just strolled up to the lathe and girl bossed that in one go, I did not. I did a test part ahead of time with all the same cutting conditions and all of those same operations, and I did catch multiple mistakes on that test part. I had done the math wrong on the starting groove depth for the thread, and a couple of the clearances on both those tool bits needed improving. So I caught all of those mistakes on the test part, and that's why this one went so well. I have never regretted doing a test part for a tricky operation, but I have frequently regretted not doing one. Well, I'm really happy with the progress so far on this little casting. Unfortunately, that is all the time I have for you this week. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you especially to all of my patrons who make this content possible. And watch out for the collaboration with Ron Covell next week on this project. And until then, I will see you next time. Until next week, I'll see you next week. What? It doesn't even make sense. What are you doing with your life, Quinn?